One of the things I miss most about being a kid are the rumors, hoaxes, and myths that would propagate themselves in the video game communities I was a part of. Perhaps it was due to my young, naive age, or the fact that we didn't really have things like OBS and capture cards to prove all of our claims in that era, but back when I was a kid, getting Waluigi in Super Mario 64 DS was worth a shot. Sonic and Tails in Melee? Well, I've never gotten 20 KOs in Cruel Smash, so who knows really? I guess I'll try again when the GameCube Portable comes out. Today I want to talk about some of my favorite fan theories and urban legends that appeared amongst fans of Club Penguin. Secret puffles, secret rooms, etc. It's kind of weird making a Club Penguin video, because I sort of quit making Club Penguin content like 10 years ago. I guess this is my long-awaited return. Anyway, there's no need to drag this out. Let's just get right into the Club Penguin folklore. One of the coolest things that would happen every few months in Club Penguin was the arrival of the Migrator, Rockhopper's ship. You could see it making its way to the main island in the prior weeks, and you just knew that once he arrived, it was gonna be awesome. I mean, after all, he is the number one penguin in all of gaming. Stelios and I determined that. First of all, the Migrator is just super cool to explore with all of its rooms. And second of all, the various items Rockhopper brings are almost certain to tickle your fancy. Sadly, however, the fun doesn't last forever. When the party came to an end, Rockhopper would sail off back to his home island, not to be seen again for at least a couple of months. Sad face. That begs the question though, where does Rockhopper go on his off-season? Well, Rockhopper's main center of operations is a far-off tropical island fittingly named Rockhopper Island, and we know almost nothing about it. It's warmer than Club Penguin Island, uh, it's a natural habitat of red puffles, and it's about a month's ship travel away. Rockhopper Island was a major source of discussion among fans of the game. Frankly, everyone wanted to go there. Everyone had their own theories and spread their own rumors about it. How to get to Rockhopper Island was a major search term on YouTube and Google, and there was no shortage of tricksters and troublemakers more than willing to take advantage of the curiosity. I found an 11 minute video detailing the complex process of going to Rockhopper Island. In a nutshell, you have to walk around the island and say a bunch of error code numbers, log off, play the jetpack game, go to the coffee shop, and if you do it right, you'll get this! Wow! The game straight up offers you a free trip to Rockhopper Island. I think my favorite part of this video, besides the classic old school screencastomatic.com, is the fact that the creator didn't even bother to do it in multiple takes. After his whole how to get Waluigi routine, you can literally see him move his cursor below the screen to change windows to Windows Media Player or whatever. It's just perfect. It's just mwah. I sometimes really miss the point in my childhood where I was starry-eyed and gullible enough to believe that doing stuff like screaming error codes into the Club Penguin chat would somehow unlock completely functional hidden features in-game. I miss that naivety. Honestly, I wasn't above the mischief either. I made a whole video where I claimed to have Rockhopper's login information with... questionable evidence. Whoa guys, isn't this so cool? I'm Rockhopper now. And look, there's Yar. Whoa, and I'm also on the Migrator. That's so cool. What can I say? I'm a lifelong satirist. I live to trick people with my elaborate hoaxes. It's in my blood. I would even change the title every new year to make it seem as relevant as possible, just to extend my cheeky ruses as long as I could. I distinctly remember coming across a theory saying you could go to Rockhopper Island if you stay in the Migrator after midnight when one of his visits ends, much like Bamba D did in Rockhopper and the Stowaway. My friend told me he actually tried it, and it sadly did not work. I actually think I hesitated to try it, because I feared that if I did, the Club Penguin moderators would think I was trying to hack or cheat the game and ban me. The school system made me a really paranoid kid. Sadly, Rockhopper Island was never added to the game in any real form. Though, honestly, I think if the game had existed for longer, they would have eventually done an event where you actually go there. Especially when you consider how often they would incorporate fan theories into the actual game. Like this next myth. There was a time in Club Penguin history where you could count all the puffles just with your fingers, and in this era, new puffles were kind of a big deal. There was a whole hype culture surrounding the gradual inclusion of new puffles, and the developers would play into it by including secret hints that would tease new additions. I'll never forget pausing the Puffle Wildlife video as a kid and seeing the white puffle for the first time. One of the first YouTube videos I ever made was just me documenting the secret orange puffle sightings before they were released. It was pretty cool. With all this puffle speculation, it was natural for fans to imagine puffles that were more than just one color. Like, why not two? Or three colors? Or maybe a full-on rainbow? 
Let's see what Club Penguin Chick 11 has to say. Okay, here's the story in 2006, May 1st to be sure. They came out with a new puffle. It was a rainbow, but only for five minutes. Only one person was left with one, and that was me. Exo Lover. I have one rainbow puffle, three red, two pink, one purple, and one blue. I started to seem when it would go away, but it did now. Here is a picture to prove it. Seems legit to me. The rainbow puffle has a head in the clouds attitude and enjoys fluffy pillows. Even though this is fan-made, that's astonishingly close to how the real rainbow puffle is described. I'm actually impressed. I also saw this video by Club Penguin Chick 11 with a bunch of other puffle designs that allegedly existed. There's an America puffle, a good option for you Patriot Penguin pet puffle lovers out there. There's a Japanese puffle as well, an upside down Indian flag puffle. And, uh, I don't know. I guess it's a Queens of the Stone Age puffle. All the hubbub by the fans about the mythical rainbow puffle eventually caught the attention of the game's developers, and they decided to actually make it a real thing. The Rainbow Puffle was introduced during the 2013 Puffle Party, along with a Puffle Hotel which was squeezed in between the pet shop and stage. In order to get it, you had to do a bunch of quests at the hotel, and then shoot up to a floating island made of clouds where the colorful creatures were hiding. You better pick one up before you get attacked by a harpy or a wyvern or something. Honestly though, I wasn't a really big fan of the Rainbow Puffle when it came out. Something about it just felt really... lacking. I don't know. They definitely tried to make it cool, but once it came out, the mystique of it all just felt a bit gone. I guess it's just an example of how a concept that is rooted in fan theories and folklore can often seem a lot less mystical and larger than life when actually created, especially because it was basically given to everyone on a silver platter. Things often don't live up to the hype when you and the rest of the community have been discussing what it could be for like seven and a half years. That's a little depressing, but it's just life. Frankly, I think they did what they could, and apparently it went well, because they decided to make the similarly theorized Golden Puffle as well only a few months later. One of the things Club Penguin did in its second half that I really disliked is what I will now call Puffle Inflation. Don't search that up. In the old school days of Club Penguin, Puffles were limited in number and much simpler in design. You had just a handful of variants, but each of these variants had their own unique animations, personalities, and preferences. The purple one loved to dance, the yellow one had an appreciation for the fine arts, and the red one was a daredevil who loved to surf. They all had their own unique room during the puffle parties, which accentuated their distinct traits. The rainbow puffle and the golden puffle were pretty much the last hurrah of this method. Starting in 2014, Club Penguin introduced what were called puffle creatures, or wild puffles. These were puffles that were partially based on other animals, with some exceptions, and they came out at a much faster pace than anything before. However, there were a few caveats. The new wild puffles didn't have the same large count of detailed animations nor the distinct personalities of the old ones, and I've always really preferred the pre-wild puffle days. It wasn't even a subtle drop in quality, honestly. Until the introduction of the Tabby Cat and Border Collie Puffles, every single Puffle had a cute little close-up interface where you could play with them, feed them, and clean them. But the new Puffles just didn't have access to this, and in order to feed them you had to use the generic Puffle Hotel feeding stations, which felt like a really big downgrade. I presume the reason behind this is that with all the new Puffles, it wasn't economical to make the amount of animations necessary for interface support. That's like a lot of work with a low return on investment. So they ended up flooding us with quirky puffle fusions that didn't have nearly as much depth as the originals. Thus the term puffle inflation. Anyway, that was just a small mini rant because I've wanted to complain about this since I was like 11. Let's talk about Car Jitsu. Car Jitsu is one of the most beloved mini games in Club Penguin, and it's not hard to see why. It brought a whole new level of dimension and complexity to Club Penguin's minigames, and the whole training up to become a ninja and access the ninja hideout thing was so cool to me. I remember my friends and me on the computer taking turns getting our black belts, and how badass I felt entering the hideout for the first time. I was especially enamored with the art and styling of the martial artworks catalog. It differed heavily from the visual direction of everything else in the game at that point, and the haikus were a really nice touch. In the years following its release, Car Jitsu would eventually be accompanied by three other games in the same vein, based on the game's original three elements, fire, water, and ice. Fire was like a board game, water was like Frogger or something, and finally Car Jitsu Ice was a strategy RPG. These minigames were not just new minigames though, with them came a whole host of new items and rewards for all the Club Penguin soon-to-be ninjas. One thing that was especially interesting was the amulet, Originally released in 2009 along with Karjitsu Fire, 
You can see clearly it has three main slots, one for each of the game's elements, and as you master the corresponding minigames, you are awarded gems that are featured on the amulet. However, there is one gem that's already there, and with its piercing black color and ominous shape, fans couldn't help but think that it represented a mysterious fourth element that would get its own Karjitsu game. But was it all just a coincidence? Um, well, I would say so. Frankly, I think the middle gem originally existed to represent the main game, with its elementally neutral gray and black color. And remember, in order to get the amulet in the first place, you have to become a black belt, meaning by the time you already get it, you've already mastered one of the Karjitsu games. That's why you already have a gem. It's for the original one. However, despite all this, the gem was a point of major fan curiosity, and it wasn't long until everyone started speculating. Card Jitsu Shadow caused a lot of buzz among the fans, and it wasn't long until the developers took notice. In 2011, they added a bunch of unobtainable items to the game. They added four clothing items that made up the Shadow Ninja outfit, and I think I can pretty confidently say that this stands up among this mother poster in this Spongebob Squid Game fan art as one of the hardest images ever made. Like, holy crap, it looks fantastic. So, is it a done deal? Card Jitsu Shadow confirmed? Well, yes and no. First of all, the items were added in June of 2011. Card Jitsu Water had only come out a few months earlier, and Card Jitsu Snow wouldn't be out for another couple of years. According to Polo Field on Twitter, it was just made as a concept for a potential mobile game. But it was there, and it had awesome animations. They even made a bunch of Card Jitsu cards that hinted at it, along with a power card that literally featured a Shadow Ninja. Frankly, if Club Penguin had lasted longer, Card Jitsu Shadow would have been inevitable. We've seen before how Club Penguin would often draw from fan rumors for new material, and they already seem to be in the process of making it, at least the early stages. They hinted at it several times over the years, and developers of the game were pretty open about liking the idea of making it. However, as we know, Disney pulled the plug before it ever got to become a reality. So yeah, Car Jitsu Shadow, the Club Penguin minigame that could have been. This specifically was really fun for me to learn about, because by the time this rumor really began to take form, I had already kind of stopped playing the game. So reading about all of this after the fact was super cool. Oh, this is the big one. Frankly, unless you've never played Club Penguin before and are only watching this video for like, my personality or something, you definitely know about this. The iceberg was always a mysterious area. Even though basically everyone knew about it, it was kind of hidden from the rest of the game. I mean, you couldn't just walk to it like most other in-game areas, and it wouldn't pop up when you moused over it unlike every other location. Well, the dojo and mine shack used to be hidden this way too, but eventually they would be linked up with the rest of the island. The iceberg though, it was always a little bit hidden. And frankly, no offense, but the very few people who didn't actually know the iceberg existed weren't really missing out on much. I mean, there was Aqua Grabber, but that was only added into the game after a few years. Before that, it was just an empty, mysterious sheet of ice. And I don't know what sparked the rumor, but it wasn't too long in the game's life cycle that people were wondering if it was possible to tip the thing over. Maybe it's because it looks really flat. Based on the black lines that define the bottom of the unsubmerged part of the body, it looks like the iceberg is a really thin structure, which is not like how icebergs are actually shaped in real life. You guys can trust me on that, by the way. I have a lot of experience with icebergs. I guess you could argue that the lighter colors here are supposed to show the submerged ice, but honestly, that always looked more like a reflection or something to me. In its early years, there was a lot of debate among young fans of the game on whether you could do such a thing. Usually, people would say that the iceberg would tip over if you had a certain amount of penguins dancing on or drilling into it. And of course, some people would claim that they did, only to either provide falsified evidence or no evidence at all. You really think someone would do that? Just go on the internet and tell lies? It seems some people believe that if you actually successfully tip the iceberg, you'd get a prize along the lines of 5,000 coins. This guy says you could get a golden puffle. Just go on the internet and tell lies? But what was really funny is that there were also people claiming it was possible, but that if you did it, you would get banned from the game, or your penguin would die or something. There was actually this one time I was playing the game and I saw a bunch of people trying to tip the iceberg. I decided to get my hard hat and join in on the effort, but then I started thinking about the possibility that I might get banned if we ended up doing it. So I logged off the game out of fear. I was an anxious kid. I also just love the idea that if you tip the iceberg, you would get banned. Like, that's so funny to me. Obviously it wasn't true, but the idea that the Club Penguin developers would fully implement this secret animated in-game feature and then ban players for activating it is just hilarious to me. 
I think the rumor started to lose its traction as something people seriously believed around 2010 or 2011, but that didn't mean it was forgotten. The Club Penguin developers were always pretty discreet with how they interacted with the community, but even they were willing to acknowledge it here and there, just to add a little fuel to the fire. However, it was always a hoax. Well, until the final Club Penguin party, that is. In late January 2017, the Waterlawn party began, and with it came the ability for penguins to finally tip the iceberg. Together, we can build an island, create a community, change the world, and even tip an iceberg. And also close down our beloved Flash game for a 3D bubble replacement that does so badly gets canned in less than two years. Sorry, that was mean. You know, even with all the unfortunate realities that came with Club Penguin coming to an end the way it did, at the very least, one of the most long-standing community urban legends in the game was able to be truly implemented in a wonderful way, and I think that's really awesome. Thanks for watching. I originally meant for this video to be a bit shorter, but I guess I just love writing about Club Penguin. I tend to have very strong opinions on Club Penguin.